the idea of the observer mm -hmm. in quantum mechanics. There's been so much malarkey that I've read and seen online about the idea of the observer changing the results that I felt like, why did everybody have to turn into voodoo? All of the people who are trying to shill quantum mechanics as an explanation for thought or behavior or love or any of these woo-woo things, none of them are fucking physicists. One, I'm a scientist, but today science is the religion of the West. It's the, it's the, the scientists who tell us what we should believe and what we shouldn't. It's the scientists that tell us what is true and what is false. So basically, they take the place of the priests of olden times. So that's one reason I write my book in terms of science. But the second is that if you are going to have a major impact on society as far as helping them understand how reality works, what their point and purpose is in this life, uh, and so on, then first you need to get the high priests of our culture to agree with you. Who are we? We're an individuated unit of consciousness playing a total immersion virtual reality game wherein our avatars make choices and appear to have physical bodies and live in physical space. Well, I think this uh, simulation theory stuff that I know you guys probably talk about on the show a lot and I endlessly think about. Endlessly. I definitely have been thinking lately more and more that that is what the case is. Because just like ridiculous things like you saying the Pokemon thing the other day, Joe, the last podcast, that was creepy to me. Like, I can't stop thinking about that. Yeah, why did I come up with Pokemon? And he had a Pokemon outfit that he just happened to have and then he walks in the room with it on. It's just fake. Like, we've never talked about Pokemon before. Me never. 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 That was fucking weird. See, that's simulation shit. What are we doing here? We're an individuated unit of consciousness with a mission to evolve the quality of our consciousness through interaction with the set and with others within this virtual reality. We're here to experience, interact, make choices. This is definitely, well, our lives are very strange. Very, very, yeah. very strange. You know, Ari and I were talking about it last night. You know, we were talking about Ari's life now, how Ari's life has just transformed over the last two years. He went from being a guy who couldn't get booked anywhere to a guy that is living a dream. It's like all of a sudden the world changed and went from sucky yeah. to awesome. Yeah. And it's like he just reached some new level of the computer game. And now the entire world that he sees, his world literally is a different world. And now all of a sudden he's in this super happy world. Everywhere he goes, people are happy to see him. Yeah. He's super positive. We're here to evolve. And as we evolve, evolve means, I can say it in several ways, it means spiritual growth. It means growing up. It means getting rid of fear, you know, ego, belief, and expectation. It uh, means lowering the entropy of your consciousness. That's what I mean by growing up, evolving. We are a unit of consciousness, and our job is to evolve the quality of that consciousness. Now, when you get rid of this fear and belief, what are you left with? What are you without that? Your love. That's what's left over when you get rid of the fear and the belief. The nature of reality, Joe, what is it? That's the thing. There's no answer to that. It's too confusing. Whatever it is, it is. And there's some real rules to this thing. And one of them that seems to make sense is that you got to be nice to people and you got to enjoy this thing and you got to spread as much fun and happiness as you can. And if you can do that, you're like a generator of happy feelings and people want to feel happy. What about love? Okay, now what's the optimum way that this society of conscious entities can interact with each other? Which way leads toward more evolution? The evolution of consciousness. Well, if you think about it for a minute, love is an obvious answer. Okay? And one of the ways I, I, I explain this is look at, um, you know, take a, take a society of 10,000 people and put them someplace and let all those 10,000 people interact with each other with love, which means they care about others. It's not about them, it's about others. Somebody discovers something, they share it. So you expect them to be cooperative, supportive, very interactive. You know, now let's take another 10,000. And let's say they're based on the opposite of love, they're based on fear. Fear is the opposite of love. Okay, now, 
Give them the same resources and the same whatever and let them go. And what do you have? Well, immediately you have hoarding. This is mine. And now I have to protect mine from you taking it away from me. We have belligerence. We have what's in it for me. Why should I help you? Why should I help you build your barn back? Matter of fact, I'm the one that lit that fire because I was trying to eliminate, eliminate competition on the market, right? The human organism as one organism and that any fighting against itself is completely and totally unnatural mm -hmm. because we are literally all the same thing. So that's what you have. What happens in these 10,000 people is that they start to pull apart because fear is divisive. Fear is high entropy. It breaks things apart. It's not cooperative. Pretty soon they would start to, you know, they're going to battle with each other, right? Because it's all about them. I've heard it argued and argued successfully that our society runs on war. Mm -hmm. You know, it runs on the domination of uh, the other parts of the world. And literally that's the only way you can control a gigantic chunk of the globe. You have to keep everybody down, you know, and that's what our society is based on. And then they're going to they want to have form little mutual protection groups so that this little group can protect them from this other group because groups are more powerful than individuals and then those groups would fight each other and pretty soon you have what we have here right pretty soon you have this physical matter reality the idea that it should be okay to go somewhere and, and engage in war to protect a society that wants to go places and engage in war that's insane whereas a few of these groups own 95 percent of all the resources and everybody else has to feed that machine you know, that's kind of the way that'll work out. Well, here we are. We kind of, we can see how that experiment's already been done, right? We can see that. But we can imagine that other experiment where everybody was cooperative, helping, trying. Now, which one of those two systems sounds like the lower entropy? See, the more ordered, the more constructive, the one that builds and grows and constructs. Well, obviously, love is the optimal way in which people can interact. That's what moves consciousness toward greater and greater evolution. So consciousness evolves by lowering its entropy. Consciousness evolves by becoming love. You can develop like a deep despair. And that's where Ari was just a couple of years ago. And now all of a sudden he's in this super happy world. His world is a different, the world is a different place now. Yeah, it's well, it, this is why I love the fucking multiverse theory. I love the idea that we exist in a place where every single possible event is happening at once. Everything that could happen is happening. It's all happening in one great eternal burst of happeningness and that you can shift yourself from different nodes of where you are now to more desirable nodes of the multiverse. You can live in multiple realities all at once. You don't have to be just constrained to this linear, uh, you know, Western rational reality. You can live in, in a much bigger reality space. I also am not, I, I'm also not just in this reality. I, while I'm at work and while I'm doing this stuff, I live and exist and experience in, in several realities kind of simultaneously. So I live in a bigger, in a bigger world. And that's what goals are. Having a goal is a form of uh, visualizing the specific node of the multiverse that you would like to be existing in and the contrast between that place and where we currently are. And it's like a grappling hook that you're throwing through infinity. Instead of living in one reality or another, I just live in the larger reality all the time. And the thing that's neat is that they help. I'm better at solving problems at work because I also am in, I see the problems from a different perspective. You can understand the double slit experiment very easily if you understand virtual reality. I talk about the old, uh, if you know, a tree falls and there's nobody there to hear it, does it make a sound? And of course the answer to that is, well, there is no woods, you know, there is no tree, there is no sound, they're all virtual. It's just information. The natural state of reality is probabilistic and statistical, okay? This is a multiplayer game. Okay, think of it with the, with the World of Warcraft video game. 
Okay, it's the same thing. What happens when there are no players in the World of Warcraft game? There's absolutely nobody to play the game. It's just the service, the server, and it's entirely empty. Does that server keep rendering trees and monsters and everything? Of course not. Rendering what? Who would it send it to? When somebody turns on their computer and logs into the game, now suddenly it starts rendering to that person whatever it is that they would see depending on where they are on the map. You see, and, and you know, this, this table, this is hard, and, and my fist hits it. How come it doesn't go through it if it's just virtual? Well, how come you can't walk through trees in World of Warcraft? How come you can't walk through rocks? You have to walk around them. Why? Well, because that's the rule set in the game. This is a sparring program, similar to the programmed reality of the Matrix. It has the same basic rules, rules like gravity. What you must learn is that these rules are no different than the rules of a computer system. Some of them can be bent. Others can be broken. The game's rule set says you can't walk through trees. You have to walk around them. The rule set here says, that's wood. I can't put my hand through it. So that's the way it works. But when there's no players, there's no data going out. So that's the way it works. So it's not like I close my eyes and the whole universe disappears. That's impossible. The whole universe wasn't there in the first place. It's just data. If they just looked at it, like literally, in what is best for mankind. Yes, that's it, man. It can be done. Totally. It can be done. And I think that even thinking along those no lines helps to change the world. But I think that oh, having yeah. this conversation and knowing this conversation is going to easily reach a million people, several million people probably over the course of, you know, the next few months. Yeah. This conversation is going to enter uh, it's it's going to be data that enters into certain people's minds and that's the kind of thoughts that we need the whole universe wasn't there in the first place it's just data it's going to be data that enters into certain people's minds it's just data it's, it's going, going to be, to be data. data we live in a virtual reality reality is composed of nothing other than information science is coming to that viewpoint more and more mm -hmm. every year you hear more and more people who realize that information is at the core of our existence. When you then try to understand these pictures, you find out that buried in them are computer codes, just like the type that you find in a browser when you go surf the web. And so I'm left with the puzzle of trying to figure out whether I live in the matrix or not. <laughs> Wait, you're blowing my mind at this moment. So you're saying... <laughs> We're an individuated unit of consciousness playing a total immersion virtual reality game wherein our avatars make choices and appear to have physical bodies and live in physical space. Are you saying your attempt to understand the fundamental operations of nature leads you to a set of equations that are indistinguishable from the equations that drive search engines and browsers on yeah, our computers? That is correct. So... Wait, wait, I'm still... Wait, I have to just be silent for a minute here. <laughs> Information is the meaning, the content, the message, not the media, not the code symbols. So you're saying as you dig deeper, you find computer code writ in the fabric of the cosmos? Into the equations that we want to use to describe the cosmos, yes. Computer code? Computer code, strings of bits of ones and zeros. It's not just sort of resembles computer code, you're saying it is computer code. It takes a consciousness to get the information. Okay. Information requires a consciousness. Time to go home, I think. I mean, I, where are we going to go? Ahead? So, so uh, are you saying we are all just, there's some entity that programmed the universe and we're just expressions of their code? Well, I didn't say that. I mean, some of those like the Matrix? You, that's what the, you said. To answer your question more directly, I have in my life come to a very strange place because I never expected that the movie The Matrix might be an accurate representation of the place in which I live. Do not try and bend the spoon. That's impossible. Instead, only try to realize the truth. What truth? There is no spoon. There is no spoon? To have Joe Rogan and Tom Campbell on the same podcast 
Be sure to tweet and share this video on Facebook and Twitter. You can also share these videos on Joe's and Tom's forums using the links in the info section below.